Uh, good morning, folks. Uh, this is the Central District Board of Health regular meeting for Friday, October 16th, 2020, 8.30 a.m. Um, pardon the brief uh, delay. We did have a power outage this morning, so we will go ahead and proceed with the meeting. Um, let me introduce myself. I am the presiding chair from Elmore County, Betty Ann Middleton. Um, our other Elmore County uh, representative is Representative Megan Blanksmore. So the meeting having been called to order, I will take roll call by county, starting with Valley County, Elmore County. Representative Blanksma here. Boise County. Commissioner Starr here. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, Ada County, Dr. Young. Jane Young here. Uh, Commissioner Lachiondo. Commissioner Lachiondo here. Uh, Dr. Epperly. Ted Epperly here. Okay, thank you, folks. Madam Chair. Right, we'll... Madam Chair, uh, this I'm... is Elf. I just got okay, on. Okay, thank you, Elf. Thank you so yep. much. Um, Proceeding on with the agenda under action item number three, uh, changes to the agenda. Russ, do you want to comment on this uh, as an introductory note? Sure, Madam Chair. So we do have two changes to the agenda. Item number two for a discussion and vote on a face covering requirement for all members of the public when inside a CDH facility with the only exception being for children under the age of two. and. Item number three, vote on minutes from October 13th board meeting. So we will need the board to vote on that agenda item to adjust the agenda if you will allow those items to be added. Okay. Thanks. Madam Chair, this is Elk. Yes, Elk, go ahead. Yes, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the agenda as amended, adding the Eight. two new discussion items. Thank you, Elf. Um, do I have a second? Madam Chair, this is Jane. I second it. Thank you, Jane. Uh, any further discussion before I call for a vote? Okay, Valley County. Uh, Commissioner Hasbrook, aye. Elmore County. Representative Bull, aye. Boise County. Commissioner Sturm, aye. Ada County. Jane, aye. Ted Epperly, aye. Commissioner Laciando, aye. Okay, thank you, folks. Um, motion unanimously passes to uh, agend the, uh, add those amendments to our agenda today. Okay, proceeding on with new business uh, under number one, we do have a petition by Spectra Pre Productions to be allowed to hold consumer shows that are currently prohibited under the large venue gathering restriction of the current Ada County Public Health Orders. Uh, Russ, would you like to introduce Mr. Beal, please? Sure, Madam Chair. So Mr. Beal has communicated with our team here at CDH on a, a number of occasions with the desire to be allowed to hold some specific consumer shows uh, this coming fall and, and winter, our staff have reviewed his plans. We believe they are well thought out as far as to ensure physical distancing, sanitation, limiting crowd sizes, face covering requirements, et cetera. So according to the current Ada County orders with gatherings limited to um, more than 50, this type of activity would be prohibited. However, as you will hear from him here shortly, uh, he would like the board's approval to go ahead and operate again with the safety plans that he he has provided to us and that we, we feel like are, uh, again, well thought out and protective of the, the vendors as well as the participants at these types of events. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over back to you, Madam Chair. And and uh, we also have Mike Keene on, by the way, to, to help with the conversation should it be needed. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Beal. Welcome. Mike Keene. 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 Mike
My name is David Beal. I am the owner of Spectra Productions. We are a local consumer show producer. Our company has been producing consumer shows in the Treasure Valley for 50 years. I've worked at Spectra for 35 of those 50, the past 22 as owner. I am here to speak to you today about our consumer shows and how I feel we can open and operate safely in today's COVID world. Currently, Central District Health has us in the mass gathering or large venue category. And although we do invite the general public to attend our consumer shows, the way in which the crowd behaves puts us closer to operating like a retail store, grocery store, or home improvement store, for example. My concern is we're being grouped in with concerts, sporting events, weddings, seminars, these traditional events that require their audience to arrive together in a small window of time, congregate closely for hours, and leave again as a crowd. Consumer show audiences operate differently. We get our attendance over the course of several days. Our Boise Fall Home Show, for instance, it is similar in size to a hockey game downtown, except we get the same amount of people over three days versus a hockey game where everyone arrives together in the span of an hour, give or take, and then sit shoulder to shoulder, cheering, screaming, yelling for hours. Our consumer show attendance comes and goes with the same ebb and flow traffic pattern, just as other retail stores do. So to my thinking, if a consumer show is a mass gathering greater than 50, then Costco has a mass gathering every single day. Target has a mass gathering every single day. Albertsons, Fred Meyer, Home Depot, Lowe's, they all have mass gatherings every single day. The tools for us to succeed, recommended safety practices, or what I would call the three W's, can be achieved at our consumer shows. And that is watch your distance, wear a mask, wash your hands. We've widened our aisles to 12 feet to provide more area for social distance. And I don't believe a single retail store in this valley has 12 foot aisles. And we are operating with reduced build, building capacity. So we couldn't pack a building with people even if we wanted to. In our safety plan, I included a page that details our attendance versus building capacity. And using the fall home show again as an example, with my projections of vendor staffing and general public attendance based on social distancing in our available aisle space, we would only be utilizing 15.8 of total building capacity. My projection for our flea market would be 25.4% of building capacity and our Christmas show would only be 17.5% of total building capacity. I'm not trying to pack a building with people and capping the overall capacity of the building is the tool we would use so that we don't. Ada County does have a mask mandate in place, and in turn, we've reminded all vendors that masks would be required for all booth personnel. Signs would be posted to remind the general public that Ada County, the, the Ada County mask mandate is in effect and masks would be required. We will add hand sanitizer stations around our floor, in addition to the restroom facilities available in the expo buildings for personal hygiene. Vendors will also be reminded to think about how their booth functions in regard to frequently touched surfaces and other hand-to-hand -hand transactions. And vendors will also be asked to have hand sanitizer and cleaning products in their booth. We are trying our best to be prepared to do this the right way, but we need an opportunity. We've wait, pa waited patiently through all the four stages of Rebound Idaho and we're excited to hit stage four as we could now start planning to do our shows. But in short order, due to miscues by a group of downtown Boise bars, all bars in Ada County were closed and Ada County was rolled back to stage three where we remain today. Recently, the same group of downtown Boise bars petitioned this board to reopen and were allowed to do so under certain conditions. So from my perspective, I see a group of bars that got an opportunity, triggered stage three restrictions, which have affected my business, and then they got a second opportunity to reopen. I'm asking that we get our first opportunity. It bears mentioning that our shows have value in the local economy. Many of our customers rely on our shows to find business for themselves. Not all businesses can afford television and radio advertising. We are the affordable alternative, but these companies will also suffer without our shows. We are proud to provide opportunities to these small businesses, helping them to reach customers and grow their business. And I want my business to survive, but you hold the future of my company in your decisions. I would hope you are willing to work with me to get my business back up and running. 
Our safety plan has already been approved, emphasized by this comment in the email I received, notifying me of the approval, quote, this plan will serve you well, end quote. I believe we already have the tools we need to hold safe shows, even while in stage three. It is my hope you'll see that all events are not the same. It is my hope that you'll see our consumer shows are not concerts or sporting events. Our consumer shows do not congregate people in one single shoulder to shoulder mass gathering. Rather, they function closer to the ebb and flow of retail environments. And I urge you to see that and grant me an opportunity, even if Ada County is in stage three. I don't wanna be penalized because our consumer shows are currently, I believe, wrongly grouped in with those traditional events, concerts, sporting events, et cetera. And I don't wanna be penalized because Expo Idaho is a large venue. It is a large building, but so is Costco's building. And so is every Lowe's, Home Depot, Fred Meyer, Winco, Target, on and on and on. Retail, we are much closer to retail than we are to a mass gathering that precipitates the close congregation of people. In closing, I'd like to say that I recognize the job you've been tasked with navigating this COVID world we all live in. And I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm passionate about what I do and that's why I've been doing it as long as I have. I want to convey that I will be as passionate about trying to do our events safely, working with Central District Health every step of the way. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Beal. Uh, the floor is now open for discussion or questions for Mr. Beal. Madam Chair, this is Diana. Yes, Diana, go ahead. Hi, Mr. Beal. So I'm sure as you're well aware, um, Ada County runs Expo Idaho and yeah. uh, we have found some workarounds um, currently where you all are bringing people in at a max 50 people at a time. Um, I understand that's not ideal, um, but I'm wondering if you could could speak to that and why you would prefer to move away uh, from that model. Well, I'm just concerned that on an hourly basis, um, again, because we have ebb and flow, um, there's no way to predict when the audience is going to show up. And I mean, we might only get 50 people in one hour, but we could get 150 people in the next hour. We could get 25 people in the next hour. It's just so hard to predict. So restricting it to 50, um, I just don't see how we could allow enough people in to keep the flow of the show going. Um, without so many people having to wait in line. And, and it might happen anyway, people have to wait in line. If we get uh, fully aware that people want to wait, but they may, they may leave, but putting us at such a tight restriction is only going to exacerbate that. And I'm just concerned that it just won't allow the, the, the show to function the way we need it to. Can I ask a follow on, please? Yes, you may. So um, thank you, Mr. Beal. And I, I also just want to recognize, um, obviously, I speak with Bob Batista quite a bit, and I understand um, you guys have been doing a tremendous job uh, really trying to do the right thing. So I want to thank you for that. Um, you. The, but along those lines, you know, this is where uh, the challenge is, is generally not um, for the vast majority of, of people who want to do the right thing. Um, it's, it's potentially for those who, um, you know, may come to said event and uh, not want to wear a face covering, etc. And I'm interested in how you are or how you plan to handle that, because as you know, um, whether it's at Expo or elsewhere, um, law enforcement doesn't want to get involved in um, getting people into the criminal justice system. So can you talk through your plan to ensure that face coverings are worn and what will you do if people refuse? Well, I have two thoughts on that. The first thought speaks directly to what we're planning on doing. We've been in touch with the security firm that um, we contract with through our contract with Expo Idaho. Uh, we can pay an enhanced fee to have somebody that is trained in um, COVID procedures uh, that they might use, for instance, at the courthouse, what have you. Um, it's a lot more per hour, but we're willing to bear that cost to have them there to speak directly to people that might not are trying to access the show without a face mask. Um, so I've got somebody of, of authority that um, is well versed in the issues to speak with them. Um, this, the second part of that, the other half of that equation is um, everywhere I go, there's, there's people that defy the order, whether I'm in Walmart or um, Albertsons, or there always seems to be a handful of people 
Um, I recently went up to the Fred Meyer at Chinden and Linder. It's very close to our office. And uh, it was middle of the day, one o'clock, and it, number one, the store, I couldn't believe how many people were at the grocery store at one o'clock in the afternoon, but there were a lot of people without masks on. So I, I know it may happen. Um, I don't wanna be in a confrontation with anybody. I would hope that everybody would do the right thing. The governor mentioned that yesterday, that personal responsibility has to bear um, a, a lot of this, and we will have signage. Uh, we've been in close communication with our vendors. As a matter of fact, leading up to today, we have spent the last um, two weeks, last week and the balance of this week, uh, telephoning every single vendor that is potentially gonna be in the fall home show and just speaking very strongly to them that masks will be required at this show, essentially giving them the opportunity to tell us that they don't wanna wear them and allow them to cancel out of the show because we don't want to wait and have those conversations when we're loading in or the first day the show's opening. So we have canvassed our, our vendors thoroughly. Um, we have a plan for signage and having this um, enhanced uh, trained uh, security guard at the door. Um, I, I don't know what else we can do, but just try to plan in that way. So one more follow on and then I'll let someone else ask questions. But I, I think, you know, certainly for me, and I'm obviously in a unique position here. And again, well, well aware of the challenges you faced. As, as you know, we run Expo Idaho as an enterprise fund and uh, we've lost over a million dollars in revenue. So it's it's been significant. Um, the difference between Fred Meyer and Expo Idaho, it is a county facility and we have a contractual relationship and I guess this isn't necessarily for the board, but given that I am very committed to making sure that anything we do at the county is following Central District Health rules to a T. Um, as we have discussed in the past through Bob, if we don't see that happening, we'll be ready to pull the plug on any events. So that's that's something that um, I know is is hard because you have to work with a bunch of, um, of, of vendors and then consumers who, um, may have different feelings, but the more that that can be out there on, on the front end, um, I think that's important to know where we stand. So Thank you, I, Diana. Can uh, you go ahead, Mr. Beal. Well, I was just gonna say, I, I kind of lost where you were saying, are you saying that if we, that if we're not following through with what we're saying, that you reserve the right to shut the event down? Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> yes. Okay, okay, I just- let's that's in our contractual relationship, as you know, with any uh, events taking place at Expo Idaho. So again, a little bit separate from this board. However, um, we have put those caveats into all the contracts um, that were that are taking place at Expo. Well, I can assure you, uh, it, everything that we have put into our safety plan with Central District Health, we plan on following through. This is my business. I want it to continue. I, I, I would be, it would be foolhardy to say one thing and then show up and, and do another at the event. I just, I can't imagine uh, that we, like I said, I, we, we're doing the best we can with our communication with our vendors, um, with our, matter of fact, in our in our script for our fall home show, we, we spell out in the script, Ada County mask mandate is in effect, so grab your mask and join us. I mean, we're, we're putting it right in our advertising uh, audio. <laughs> And I want to be clear, I understand that, and it's it's not you I'm worried about. It's, um, you know, perhaps a vendor, it's it's patrons, and, and it's really unfortunate that some people have the potential to ruin it for everyone. But uh, I appreciate that you're putting that into your advertising. I think that's really, really critical to set expectations. So thank you very much. That's exactly why we did it, to set that expectation. And, and I know there's people that don't want to wear a mask, and that was part of it too, is I know there's a mask mandate. If they hear that in the advertising, they'll go, well, I'm not gonna go to that show. That, that is fine, That that's, I guess what we're looking for because we don't really want the confrontations with masks. Um, so yes, that was kind of our telling our customers, our potential customers, masks will be required at this event. Madam Chair, this is Ted. Uh, yes, Ted, go ahead. So Mr. Beal, thank you. Um, I came into this meeting uh, thinking no way in hell, but actually after I've listened to what you've said and 
your thoughtfulness and how you're going about it. I think you've made some great points of why we should reconsider this at sizes greater than 50. So thanks for that. My question, my question is around uh, two things. Uh, the dates of these three shows, can you just remind us uh, from the home show to the flea market to the Christmas shows, what are the dates? And then I, I, I'm going to have a follow-up question based on that answer. <clears throat> so the fall home show would be next weekend. We would open on the 23rd and it would run the 23rd, 24th, 25th. That's the fall home show. The flea market would be November and uh, that date would be uh, 14th and 15th. And then the Boise Christmas show would be December. We open on the 4th and that show will run the 4th, the 5th and the 6th. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, as we all know, the numbers will probably get considerably worse over the next couple of months. Uh, I do like your thinking of how you're going to go about this though. Um, to build off of Commissioner Lachiando's point, because it sounds very much like you all are going to do the right thing. Uh, my concern also is around uh, people that will come that won't necessarily agree with that. And it sounds like you've taken the steps to try to both pre-market this in terms of masking and having kind of a reinforcement in terms of engaged discussions at the door so that people uh, won't, you know, barge in unmasked. What I'd like to suggest, is, and, and Commissioner Lachiando, you really kind of helped set the stage for this, is, um, and maybe Russ, um, a question for you as well with what I'm going to say is, can we ensure that as we watch how the home show unfolds on the 23rd through the 25th of October, if that seems to go well, then I would agree that then each successive show with that plan should be uh, should be done. Uh, if it doesn't go well and it's chaotic, uh, it looks like Fred Myers, uh, as you were relating, then I think we should reserve the right to not uh, approve all three at one time but one sequentially, and let's see how it goes. If it goes well, and it goes to your plan, which I hope it does, because all of us want to see the economy continue and businesses continue. We don't want to disproportionately affect you because you are running this more like a retail store instead of a big um, event. Uh, then I would think that we sequentially then do that. So uh, Russ, to you with that statement made, and. David, maybe you can respond as well, but Russ, do we plan to have some degree of observation during the show to make sure this is done right? If it is, I would certainly be in favor of sequentially letting Mr. Beal do all three shows. I'll stop. Madam Chair, this is Russ. Yes, Russ, go ahead. We had not planned on sending staff down to observe very much like we have not sent staff out to observe bars, but we do rely on the public, which they've been very good at notifying us through phone calls to the office, phone calls to the call center, sharing photographs and videos. So I feel like there's a, a good chance we will know if uh, Mr. Beal's plans are not working out as he has indicated. That said, if the board would like us to have staff go uh, on one or two or all three days, we can figure out a way to make that happen. Madam Chair, this is Diana. I, I would concur to have someone come and visit. I think when we hear from the public, um, they don't necessarily have the trained epidemiology lens. Some people can be kind of really worried about just numbers of people and not seeing that they're masked, et cetera. So I would I would like to have staff visit. Go ahead, El. Madam Chair, this is El. Yes, El, go ahead. Um, Mr. Beal, are you still on? Yes, I am. Um, I had a question on number seven and number eight of your implementation plan. 
uh, signage to remind ill or symptomatic individuals to not enter the show. And then number eight is security personnel to watch for congestion. Have you guys thought about temping everyone as they come in? We've thought about, just, uh, um, we didn't put it on our plan. I, I, I guess the reason I didn't put it in our plan is we, we don't see it out in anywhere else um, that I'm calling similar to us through these retail environments. I don't see anybody else doing it. So um, we, we have not put that in our plan, no. Well, the reason I ask that is we've been doing it at our courthouse facility since the beginning of this in March, and it's worked very well. Everyone that comes in is temped. And anybody over 100 degrees is asked to leave the facility. And I think it's it's something that we may want to consider for this event. And I also agree with Dr. Epperly that I don't think we need to give permission for all three. Let's do one and see how it works. If it works great, then we can come back and talk about the next event. But what we're doing here is, is we're exposing ourselves to a high risk of um, infection. That's my opinion. Okay, thank you, Elf. Uh, anybody else have any questions for Madam Mr. Chair? Bull? Yes. I just, um, I don't know a lot about these events, um, Mr. Beal. I just, are there other companies that also put these events on? There are. Madam Chair? Madam Chair. Uh, I'm sorry, I lost you just for a moment. Hello? Madam Chairman, just a comment, if I may. Yes, go ahead, Megan. Um, I have concerns about signaling out a particular business and exempting them rather than exempting a category if we're going to do this. So I, I don't know that if if there's going to be a motion to approve the plan, and I am fully in support of that, I do think that it needs to be a categorical exemption, not just a business specific um, exemption. Hey, thank you. Madam Chair, this is Diana. Yes, go ahead, Diana. Um, I hear that, uh, Representative Langsma. My concern is that. Um, well, and we, we can discuss this probably on Tuesday, but um, we provided a categorical exemption to bars and we're now in a situation where we, we do have some flagrant abusers out there who are not following the protocols. And um, that's something that law enforcement needs to take up or not take up. But my concern is that um, to Mr. Beal's point, I don't wanna unfairly end up punishing um, particular businesses who are doing a really good job um, when there are some who, who are not. So I'd rather start with him, see how this goes. He's being proactive, have a really great, has a really great plan in place. Um, and then we could potentially roll out to others if it works out. Madam Chair, this is Ted. Yes, Ted, go ahead. I would agree with that comment from Representative or Commissioner Laciando, even when we returned to the bars, uh, we made sure they each individually had a plan that was well thought out and approved by Central District Health. Uh, I would be very much opposed to a blanket category without a well thought out plan, just like we did with the bars. So if other companies out there want to do that, would certainly entertain a well thought out plan and discussion just like Mr. Beal has done. But I don't think we should blanket categorically approve them without a plan. Madam Chair, this is Jane. Uh, yes, Jane, go ahead. I just wanted to speak, speak uh, saying that I am in favor of uh, allowing the 50 plus and I really appreciate him putting in the plan. Um, I came into it not expecting to be in favor of it. So I really appreciate all the work that you've done to come up with a plan as well. Madam Chair. Yes, Megan, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think we're, I don't understand why we would want to continue to reinvent the wheel. 
I agree. Mr. Beal has come up with an excellent plan. I am completely in favor of it, but it can the, that plan can be used to affect other companies and you could make a categorical um, exemption based upon the existing plan that was provided for us if that would be the recommendation by Central District Health to accept that plan. I think that we're getting into shady category when government, which we are, is picking and choosing winners and losers. And that's what would be happening here if you exempt one particular company. Now, if you want to accept the plan and for other companies where the situation applies, you make sure that they implement that plan that everybody seems to agree is, is a good plan, then I think that's fair. But I think we're getting into a situation that makes me very uncomfortable. I, I very much appreciate the plan. I very much want to go forward with it, but I, I don't think it's, it's our job to decide which companies get to go forward and which companies don't get to go forward. Okay, thank you, Megan. Madam Chair, this is El. Yes, El, go ahead. Well, I, I think it's probably a reasonable plan, but we don't really know if it's gonna work until we go through the event to categorically, you know, allow everyone 50 or plus with a plan, uh, I think we need to see how this first one works. And if it works great, then I would be behind you, Megan, as far as, okay, then let's change the whole category or change the number. But let's see how this works first. We're, we're in the worst shape we can be right now, and now we're starting to, to lax the rules. Are we gonna make this worse or is it gonna work? That's my concern. Okay, thank you, El. Uh, Russ and Mike, would you like to weigh in on how we may navigate moving forward with this issue for Mr. Beal? Let me go first if I can, Madam Chairman. Uh, what Mr. Beal has done is essentially asked for a variance similar to what um, the county commissioners might see in a planning and zoning situation. You have a gathering order He's presented a plan that basically, I believe, shows you that this is not a typical gathering. It is more akin to a retail. So we would have to, assuming that you agree to this, draft an order allowing that to happen based upon the plan that has been submitted to you. Um, if you want it to be um, more global, you would have the ability to do that as well, similar to what you did with ours, in which anybody who wants to um, emulate what Mr. Beal has done would have to come to Russ and, and demonstrate to him that he's got a plan that is similar um, to what Mr. Beal is doing. So that would be an option for you as well. So essentially what I'm saying is you can do it on a one-time event at this time, or you can delegate to Russ as you did with the bars to uh, examine future plans and uh, act accordingly. Thank you, Mike. Russ, do you have a comment? Uh, Madam Chair, I, you know, I, I don't have anything else to add beyond what Mike just explained and it really is up to the board. This is before the board, it's the board's orders to decide how you want to proceed. and. Sounds like you know what the options are. Okay, so um, Mike, do we just need to put this as an agenda item for our Tuesday uh, meeting? No, you can you can make the motion now. Wait, okay. Madam, okay. Madam Chair, sure this is this is Ted. I'm prepared to make a motion. Okay, Ted, go ahead. I would propose that we move forward. Uh, with Mr. Beal's plan for Spectra shows to do their first show, their home show on the 23rd through the 25th of October, and that we would have Central District Health observe that show, that we uh, get a report back, and if the show proceeds in an orderly fashion that is safe for the public's health, for attendees, for vendors, that we would then move forward with uh, approving his further shows so that we know that we are doing this in a stepwise and safe manner. 
And I would propose that we just limit this at this point to Spectra shows. If other similar companies uh, want to do what Mr. Beal has thoughtfully put forth, they are free to do so. Uh, and we will entertain those by Mr. Duke. That is my motion. Okay, thank you, Ted. Is there a second to the motion? Madam Chair, this is Jane, I second it. Thank you, Jane. Any further discussion before I ask for a vote? Hearing none, we'll proceed. Uh, actually, uh, I'm sorry. I wanna make sure, cause I'm gonna have to write this order. Um, are you then saying that you're delegating to Mr. Duke future shows, including Spectra? That's what I thought I heard. This is Jane, that's my intent. And it was mine too, Mike. Uh, I think that we can have Russ and his operational staff use good judgment on that. Okay, thank you. Hearing no further discussion, I will call for a vote by county, starting with Valley County. Commissioner Hasbrook, aye. Elmore County. Representative Blanksma, aye. Boise County. Commissioner Sturm, aye. Ada County. James Young, aye. Ted Epperly, aye. Commissioner Lachando, aye. Okay, thank you folks. The motion passes unanimously and thank you, Mr. Beal, for your, your input. So. Thank you. so am I, that vote approves me today to move forward? That's my understanding. Is that correct, Mike? Yes, we'll get to, we'll get to the order out to Russ right away. Okay, because okay, I just, because I'm at oh, go ahead, Mr. Beal. I'm at the 11th hour. I need to know for sure that when I get off this phone call that I can start my ball rolling because if this goes into next week, I, I won't have enough time to put the fall home show together. Your, sounds like you're all systems go, Mr. Beal. And uh, I want to be clear. Um, we want to work in partner with, partnership with you at Expo. I know you work really, really closely with Bob, um, but you can feel free to reach out to me too. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, proceeding on under new business, we have a discussion and did somebody speak? Madam Chair, this is Russ. I think Dr. Epperly was, was speaking, but he was on mute. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, did you have something to say? Yes, Mr. Beal, are you still there? Yeah, I just about, was about to leave, but I thought I'd wait to hear what you had to say. Oh, okay, thank you. I, I just wanted to make clear that uh, we want you to succeed. Uh, but we will be watching that first show. So before you start advertising for the flea market or the Christmas show, we've got to make sure that first one goes. But your all systems go for the first show. Please do it well, do it safely, and the other ones will follow. I will try my hardest. And, and, and just so you know, I'm aware of watching COVID every day. Um, I know you, every one of you are doing it. And I know each event, even though you're giving me a green light for the fall home show with the possibility. I know every event is COVID permitting from here on out. So just because you're saying yes to this and we get through the next one, um, I know there's a fear of, of flu season and second waves and, and that Christmas show, you know, I have concerns of my own that we get into December and the situation might be differently. So I'm not taking this any farther than trying to get through next weekend and then we'll just take it uh, event by event after that. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beal. All right. Okay, goodbye. Uh, proceeding on with the discussion and vote for face covering requirements for all members of the public, public when inside a central district health facility, with the only exception being for children under the age of two. This is an, a new agenda item that we approved this morning uh, or added to the agenda this morning. So. Um, is there any discussion? Madam Chair, this is Representative Blanksma. Yes, Megan, go ahead. Um, my question would be for uh, Mike Kane. Has this uh, reviewed with regard to the um, Disability Act? Because I, I have concerns about that. 
Well, we, we are certainly aware of the Americans with Disability Act. Um, what we're speaking about here, as I understand it, is for people who wish to come and observe the events in question, that, such as today, as opposed to patients. Um, if you are barring patients who cannot wear a mask, that's a different situation entirely, and the ADA would definitely apply. Um, I understood this to be limited to people who are coming, as I say, to be spectators. Under those conditions, um, they have other options available to them, which would be live streaming. And under those conditions, I don't believe it would be an ADA violation to simply say, go look at live streaming as opposed to coming into this facility. So under, under those conditions, I think we would be ADA compliant. Madam Chair, this is Elk. Yes, Elk, go ahead. Mike, I have a question for you because we ran into the situation at our own courthouse. People will come in and say, I have a medical exemption. Don't they have to provide written documentation of that exemption? They can't just say, my doctor says I don't have to do this. Actually, your order doesn't say that. Um, it doesn't require, in fact, I, I believe it specifically says exactly the opposite. You can't force someone. And that was based uh, probably on practicalities when the order was first put together. And keep in mind that it, that was also based upon Boise City Ordinance, which had that language in it. Um, again, we're, we're talking not about people who want to enter the facility for medical treatment who are you know, doing business and who would not be able to do business otherwise. Um, we're talking about spectators who are coming and, frankly, trying to disrupt proceedings on occasion. Under those conditions, you, I believe you can require them to wear masks. And if they don't want to, they don't have to. They have other options, and that would be viewing live streaming. Any further thoughts from the board? Madam Chair, this is Diana. Yes, Diana, go ahead. Um, so we discussed this a few weeks ago when Russ had asked me about moving to the courthouse and, you know, I'm, I'm in support of this, this motion, but I'm also, I'm, I'm nervous for the staff and, and frankly, you know, you've got hired security who, um, you know, are doing the very best they can, but that is a challenging situation for them. And so I'm just wondering if, if the whole, um, location, sort of tenor of the situation continues to be a problem, or do you feel like this is enough, Russ? Madam Chair, this is Russ. Yes, Russ, go ahead. I feel like we, you know, this is a good place to start. What we had happen on Tuesday were individuals who would not wear a mask, would not physically distance. We're in very close contact with our staff as well as the security team, putting them at, at great risk for the transmission of coronavirus. So I, I, I feel like we should give this a try to start. Uh, we do require physical distancing when in the room, but these individuals came into one of our lobby areas well ahead of the meeting. Again, as Mike, Mike alluded to, there's a clear intent just to disrupt the meeting. It, it was not intended to come and listen. Uh, and there was prolonged close contact with my team, which is of great concern. So as a starting point, I'd prefer to go down this path. And if we have another incident where Boise Police Department has to have officers on site, which was the case on Tuesday, then I think we can look at alternatives. Thanks. Madam Chair, this is Elk. Yes, go ahead, Guy. So, Russ, could you explain to me the alternatives? Madam Chair? Yes, go ahead, Russ. A couple of alternatives would be, we've talked about, is to hold it at a facility, facility like the Ada County Courthouse, where they have protocols in place. Uh, 
uh, very stepped up security. They do this day in, day out as far as managing crowds, requiring face coverings. And that would be obviously a convenient site for me, but I'm also more than willing to go to other county courthouses, for example, such as Elmore County, where they also have uh, security in place and would have adequate space for us to have meetings that it could possibly rotate uh, from from different sites, but I, I would not want to move it to a place that's just as unsecure as this facility is. I would want to go to a site where they've been doing this for months. Madam Chair, this is Ted Epperly. Yes, Ted, go ahead. I'm prepared to make a motion um, and uh, if, if the group is willing to hear one. Yes. From the board. Uh, Madam Chairman. Yes, Megan, go ahead. This, I, we have a mask mandate in place in Ada County. I have some serious concerns about going so far as to say that there's no medical exemptions because that's essentially what we're talking about doing here. Uh, and I'm, I am concerned whether it sounds like there's a lot of gray area with the Disabilities Act on this. And, and I, I'm just, I have reservations about it. I, I think safety of staff is really important. And if we can maybe focus on a way to keep the contact between staff and, and visitors to a minimum, I think that would, that's great. We could maybe focus on that direction. But I do have some concerns about the way this is, from what I understand, how it's been worded and not allowing anybody any exemption and unless they're children under the age of two. So that that would be my concern. Madam Chair, this is Daniel. Well, I think that's why I brought up the alternative locations because I, I have continuing concerns. We have clinical services being provided at Central District Health that get disrupted and um, staff who staff and and frankly a security team who are not prepared to handle these situations in the way that we would be at the Ada County Courthouse or at the Valley County Courthouse or the Elmore County Courthouse. So um, for me, if we don't do this, then we're going to need to look at alternate locations. And I, I I don't care if it's here wherever, but we need the Central District Health staff to be able to do their jobs without. Um, being threatened. Madam Chair, this is Elk. Yes, Elk, go ahead. We went through this similar discussion back in March when we secured our facility and required everyone coming into the building to wear their mask. And we had some people concerned about, well, how can I do this if I, I can't wear a mask? Well, we provided other venues where they can watch the meetings, they can call in on the phone. There's all types of other ways that people can attend the public hearings and still be a part of it. And it's worked great. I don't think anybody's challenged us on it. So um, we are, I think we are, we need to get ahead of this and secure our facility and make it safe for our health and our staff and, and the people coming in and out. It just makes good common sense to me. Madam Chair, this is Ted. Yes, Ted, go ahead. Uh, I'm going to make one comment and then I'm going to make a motion. Um, there are very, very few reasons for medical exemptions for masks. <clears throat> and the intent here by the people that attended on Tuesday was to disrupt. There are, as Mike Kane pointed out, multiple opportunities for people with medical conditions to listen to the live stream and to be a part of this. So as opposed to taking uh, the more drastic step of moving location to the courthouse, I'd like to do this interim step by making the motion that we do ensure that all people that are entering the Central District Health Facility that are over the age of two are masked. I think that is the win-win right now. Let's try to protect the staff. We certainly want the attendance and participation of the public if they wanna come, but they have to come with that understanding if not, there's another option for them that they can watch by live stream. So that's the motion. Thank you. Madam Chair, I'll yeah. second that. Good. Um, any further discussion? 
before I call for a vote by county. Okay, calling for Valley County's vote. Commissioner Hasbrook, aye. Elmore County. Representative Langsman, no. Boise County. Commissioner Sturm, aye. Ada County. Jane Young, aye. Chad Epperly, aye. Commissioner Laciando, aye. Okay, thank you, folks. The motion does pass. Okay, moving on to uh, action item number three. We uh, are re asking for a vote to approve the minutes for our October 13th, 2020 board meeting. And is there, are there any uh, additions or corrections in the minutes? If hearing none, I will ask for a motion for approval of those minutes. Madam Chair, this is Jane. Yes, Jane, go ahead. Um, I move that we accept the minutes from October 13th um, Board of Health meeting as written. Okay. I'll second that, Commissioner Hasbrook. All right, um, any, any further discussion before we move on? So hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Uh, once again, Valley County. Commissioner Hasbrook, aye. Elmore County. Representative Langsma, aye. Boise County. Commissioner Sturm, abstain. Uh, Ada County. Jane Young, aye. Chad Epperly, aye. Commissioner Laciando, aye. Okay, thank you very much. Um, motion passes to approve the minutes from our October 13th meeting. Uh, well, Madam Chair, Mike Kane, can I, uh, I'm going to leave the meeting now and get to work on the orders. I don't think I have anything um, to add to the next uh, part of the agenda. So I'm going to be leaving the meeting now. Okay. Thank you so much for your assistance you. this morning, Mike. Appreciate it. Okay. Moving on, uh, we are going to uh, hear from Bonnie Spencer regarding our financial reports for fiscal year 2020. Uh, Bonnie. Thank you and good morning. Good morning. Okay, so I'm reviewing the budget to actual report for September, which is um, three months into our fiscal year or 25% of the fiscal year. Um, the page that's on display now shows total revenues are high at 37% of budget. Expenditures are pretty much right on target at 26% of budget. Revenues are high um, primarily with COVID funding that's been coming in and that was not included in our original budget. Total fees is right at 25%. Uh, family and clinic service fees are a little under the 25% mark, but those will pick up with flu clinic revenues over the next month or two. Looking at contracts, that's already at 47% of budget. And that again is primarily due to COVID funding sources that were not included in our original budget. Also, you can see family and clinic services, contract revenues are a little high, um, but we had 100 and I believe it was $111,000 budgeted for state home visitation that was budgeted in the other category, but it, when, it, when it was received, it was credited to contracts. So that will be corrected in the budget revision. Um, looking at other revenue, that's also high in total at 69%, but we have our, already received our one-time funding for the Millennium Fund, the Citizen Review Panel, um, and the witch sea funds from the state. And again, family and clinic services is low, but that 111,000 budgeted for state home visitation was credited to contract revenues. So then jumping down to expenditures, total personnel, this is showing 24%, um, which is surprising given that we've had a lot of overtime and temp staff with COVID. But I did want to point out, if you look at the number of pay periods we've already incurred, 
we're actually about 6% over where we would expect to be. So it is actually high. Um, you can see also that in personnel, there's a lot of variance between what was budgeted and actual expenditures uh, among the different divisions. And that is because of staff being shifted from their normal activities to the COVID response, which shows up under community and environmental health. Then looking at operating, it's at 26%. Community and environmental health is a little bit higher, again, with COVID activities. Capital expenditures are at 155% of budget. That is due to um, the final Boise office remodel project payment in support services. And that was carried over from last fiscal year. Also, we had um, almost 2,300 in expenditures for community and environmental health for AV equipment to support the COVID response. And that was not budgeted. So Dustin, if you can go to the next page. Okay, um, I just wanted to point out on this page, if you look at the detail on fees, um, we've got continued um, growth overall in our environmental health programs. Um, in fiscal year 21 over fiscal year 20 and 19. So that's a good trend that's continuing. But also this year, we're seeing a lot of growth in our family and clinic services fees. And again, these are the figures for um, July through September of the current year compared to the last two fiscal years. And the growth in, Chris and I discussed the growth in family and clinic services there are a few contributing factors to that growth. Um, first of all, we've expanded staff efforts to collect on outstanding accounts. Um, we've also improved the timeliness of our collections on immunization uh, services. We are now receiving Medicaid revenues for behavioral health. That's that 5,500 under state home visitation. And also, we've adjusted um, based on our medical director's recommendation, we have adjusted the billing codes we use for certain visit types. So we're using more appropriate um, codes, but they're also higher paying codes. So this is the benefit to that. Um, and again, if you look at the personnel cost detail, you can see where um, the underlined line, the percentage over or under that 5.8%, that is based again on the number of pay periods we've incurred. Then Dustin, if you can go to page three. Okay, the cash balance statement shows total cash over 4 million, reducing the cash balance by the reserve fund designations leaves undesignated cash balance of 1 million 683,999. That is about $450,000 higher than our balance at September of last year. And as typical, that balance will dwindle down over the next few months um, until we receive the second half of our state appropriation in January. Next. Okay, this page um, just provides more detail on the projects that were included in our reserve fund designation for special projects to be funded with carryover funds from last year. Uh, they're all related to the Boise office and the remodel in particular. Um, of these projects, we have already incurred almost $147,000 in costs and again, that is for the final payment for the Boise office remodel. So that leaves a balance um, unspent of 151232 And that balance was reflected on the cash balance statement on page three. So that's all I have, unless there are any questions. Chair, this is Yes, Elk, go ahead. 
Hey, Bonnie, uh, part of the issue I have is when we see the screen, your your picture has covered up some of the numbers and I can't really see a lot of it. Can you tell me where we are as far as the counties and their payments? Yes, I can. Right now, the county payments have been um, 34% of the budgeted amount. So when will you get the rest of that in December? January? It varies. Most of it varies. Um, the, our, four, our four counties pay on a different schedule. Ada County typically makes their largest payment in February. Okay. Yep. Okay, just so we can cash flow it to there. I think we're going to be all right. Yep. Yeah, looks good. Great, great job. Yeah, I wish I was um, going out with a more exciting report, but it's, yeah, just kind of <laughs> more of the same. There will be a lot of adjustments on the um, budget revision that is presented to the board or will be presented to the board, I believe, in January um, because of COVID and COVID in particular. There will be a lot of adjustments. Any further uh, uh, discussion or question for Bonnie regarding our financial report? Well, hearing none, Bonnie, I just want to express for the entire board our appreciation for the exemplary job that you have done. And you have just been so extremely pleasant to work with. And uh, I just wish you uh, joy and success with this new chapter in life. And uh, I'm sure that I speak for the, the entire board when I say that. So. Thank you very much. And I feel very fortunate to have been able to wrap up my career with Central District. And the board has been wonderful to work with. I feel very fortunate. Thank you. Well, thank you again. <laughs> Madam Chair, this is Elk. Yes, Elk, go ahead. I just wanted to tell Bonnie that you can always change your mind and unretire, but if not, I hope to see you more in Valley County for the for the next few years. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I hope to be up there during the week instead of on weekends <laughs> to avoid the crowds. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. Madam so Chair. Joy, joy Madam Chair. To you. Uh, I'm sorry. Who spoke? Who spoke up? Madam Chair, this is Ted. I'd just like to make a comment and a question to Bonnie. Uh, yes, Bonnie, uh, as has been expressed by many, uh, thank you. Uh, you. You've done a remarkable job with us. I really appreciate it. A question, uh, who's following you? Do we have that person yet? Uh, just for the information to the board, maybe I missed it somewhere. Um. We have not selected um, anyone yet. We've been through several interviews and just haven't found the right fit for our agency. So we are reannouncing the position. Uh, we modified the announcement looking at possibly shifting um, the requirements, maybe shifting some of the fiscal more to our existing fiscal staff. Um, and I have told Russ, Russ will be um, supervising my direct reports in my absence, but I have told Russ, I will continue to assist, you know, like be in the office maybe one or two days a week, certainly until we find someone and until they're oriented. So I'll be around a little bit for a little bit longer. <laughs> and I don't know if Russ wants to add anything. Russ? Um, Madam Chair, yeah, I, not on that particular issue because you summarized it very well, Bonnie, but I just wanted to acknowledge your, I guess it's a little over seven years that we've worked together. And as you know, when you came on board, we, we definitely had some challenging areas with some of our uh, policies uh, with information technology. You've advanced our for example, environmental health, our food inspections to become electronic, which has greatly uh, made our team more efficient. 
We have a new electronic health record system. As the board is well aware, we had a massive remodel for the Ada County office, which you were directly involved in from the planning phase to, as was noted in your budget report, uh, the final payment, hopefully. And, uh, you know, exceptional job with, with budgets. Uh, I've, you know, total confidence, including preparing last year's uh, state budget for all seven public health districts, which is no small undertaking. Uh, we've successfully made it through all of our legislative services audits with zero findings. Again, uh, much credit to you, or I should say total credit to you for that, as well as navigating some challenging HR issues through the years, which you've been a, a great partner and thought partner in helping us through those, uh, you know, both for the employee's benefit and for the benefit of the agency. So I, I have so much appreciated uh, the working relationship we've had. I am extremely thankful that you're going to stay on a little bit longer on a very part-time basis. I know you'll be busy with uh, grandkids and travel back and forth to Valley County, as Elt had noted uh, during the week. And uh, so just, it's kind of a, a different kind of time to celebrate somebody's retirement where we're sitting around on a screen, but uh, I wish we could be in a room together and that's not possible, but uh, just extremely grateful that you decided to join us and that you stayed on as long as you did. So I, I, I wish you well and uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Russ, I appreciate that. Sincerely. We'll give you a, a toast at some point, Bonnie. So go and enjoy your retirement and uh, go bug out up in beautiful Valley County. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Bonnie, thank you so much. And uh, like I say, joy and success to you in this next chapter of your life. So. Okay, proceeding on with our action items. Uh, we'll have a presentation and discussion for the Valley County Opioid Response Project by Laura Smith, our Health Policy and Promotion Program Manager. So, Laura, go ahead. Thank you so much, Madam Chairwoman and members of the board. Thank you for making time for me today and Russ for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Um, for those of you who I haven't had a great chance to interact with in person, as a quick reminder, um, I joined CDH just about a year ago. I lead our health policy and promotion team, and we are a team of about seven. Valley County Opioid Response Project is a program that began before my arrival at CDH, but I am very pleased to share about its expansion with you today. So if Dustin, you could go to the next slide, please. So the Valley County Opioid Response Project, or VCOR as we call it, is a focus on prevention, treatment, and recovery from opioid use disorder in Valley County. We certainly also touch on other substance use disorders, but the main focus of the program is opioid use. Our key objectives are partnership building, education, capacity building and training, stigma reduction, access to treatment, continuity of services, and then of course an evaluation of everything that we're doing. Um, I know that sounds like some pretty broad categories, and they certainly are, but um, we have a village, and it takes a village to get this work done, so I'll share a little bit more about that with you. Um, but first, I'd like to lay a little bit of groundwork about opioid use in Valley County. So, Dustin, if you would please go to the next slide. So, in Valley County, um, we have some statistics here comparing the U.S. to Idaho as well as to Valley County. And um, the first graphic shows the opioid prescriptions dispensed per 100 people. So as you can see, our rates are rather high in Valley County. Um, throughout Idaho, the majority of those prescriptions are oxycodone, followed by hydrocodone, morphine, methadone, and codeine in that order. Um, and then the next graphic we have is the drug-induced deaths per 100,000 people. So Idaho as a whole is doing pretty well compared to the U.S but as you can see, Valley County has significantly more drug-induced deaths per that population. And um, four Valley County deaths with at least one drug specified on the coroner's report, 100% of those involved op opioids. Um, our number there is eight. That seems relatively small, but given our population in Valley County, um, that's significant and definitely something worth paying attention to. Um, so, 
Per the Centers for Disease Control um, and Prevention, opioids, both prescription and illicit, are the main driver of drug-induced deaths throughout the U.S. Valley County is no different, and in fact, um, the drug-induced deaths in Idaho in 2016 rose slightly from 2014 and 2015. Um, also of note, I am giving statistics that are a little bit old. Um, the data that we have throughout Idaho, but specifically in Valley County for this project, are a little bit old. We definitely need some new systems to make sure that we're on top of the most recent data, and that will certainly be part of this project as well. Um, some additional considerations for opioid use in Valley County is how large of an area it is, how rural some of our communities are. In fact, Frontier um, is a description for much of the area. Um, there's a lack of treatment options and transportation options to get to those treatment providers. There's a lack of childcare supported treatment, which is really important for our families. And um, then seasonal factors, of course. We know a lot of people come in and out of Valley County depending on the season, and those all weigh in on our opioid use in the area. Dustin, if you would go to the next slide, please. So in 2018, CDH received the first of two grants on this project. So this is really what kicked off our V Corps. Um, it was a $200,000 grant from HRSA through their R Corps program, which stands for Rural Counties um, Opioid Response Program. And the goals of the planning grant were to reduce prevalence of opioid use among families, educating youth grades 6 through 12 and their parents on prevention strategies and associated risks, and then to support training for local medical providers. Um, a lot of that work was not done just by CDH, but in collaboration with various partners, and we are excited to have added a number of partners through this program over the last two years. Dustin, if you would go to the next slide, please. So this year, just as COVID was hitting, we were lucky enough to be able to write a long grant um, application for the implementation funding, and we received it. We are one of 84 grantees across the entire country, one of two in Idaho. Um, Public Health District 1 actually also received the same implementation funding this year. So we will be working with them to see if there's any statewide um, programs that we can share. Um, so this million dollars will be used over the course of three years, um, began September 1st and will run through August 2023. Um, specific to CDH, we will be hiring a 0 .0, or a .5 excuse me, FTE project director. We actually have interviews for that position starting next week. Um, that project director will be responsible for coordinating the consortium. Meetings are monthly. We have 24 organizational partners, and that is all led by a steering committee. Um, and the project director will, for the most part, be managed will be responsible, excuse me, for managing the subgrantee contracts. We have five contractors as a part of this grant um, and just making sure that we're getting all of our data coordinated, reporting, and so forth. Dustin, next slide, please. So this is a quick overview of our consortium. Um, we do feel that it is absolutely necessary to have every single partner at the table, and so we have kind of a, a wheel design for our um, organizational chart without every piece of this wheel, nobody would really be able to get things moving. Um, so Central District Health there is at the middle. Um, we are the main grantee, of course, for this program. There are some additional funds that are um, provided by various partners in kind to the program, um, but specific to the grant, we are it. Boise State University is our first sub-grantee, and they are our evaluator for the program. Dr. Roy Hudson served as our evaluator for the planning grant, and will continue on through this implementation grant. And then our steering committee will lead the actions of the entire consortium for the next three years. Um, we have areas um, represented, the three areas of focus, that is uh, prevention, treatment, and recovery, as well as the member at large. And so everybody will have a voice at the table through the steering committee and through all of the actions taken by this consortium. Our four other sub-grantees, in no particular order, are ECHO Idaho out of the University of Idaho, um, YAC, which is the West Central Mountains Youth Advisory Coalition, EPIC Psychological Services, which is a um, 
small psychological services firm um, led by a gentleman who lives in Valley County, and then Peer Wellness Center who actually stretches um, beyond Valley County, does a lot of work in Ada County and surrounding areas as well. Um, that is not to say that there are not significant contributions from other members of this consortium, but the group decided that those were the five main people who really needed, or five main organizations, I should say, who really needed some additional funding support in order to make sure that this was a successful program. Dustin, next slide, please. So a little bit about what we will be doing. Um, the HRSA program dictated about 15 required activities for us. And I could share an eight-page document with everybody about our work plan to accomplish all of these tasks, but that would take far too long. Um, so if you're interested in that, I would welcome any questions about it, welcome email conversations and so forth. Um, but a quick overview, um, providing culturally and linguistically appropriate education, providing access to and training on naloxone, naloxone being um, key in preventing overdose deaths implementing a year-round drug take-back program, increasing support for the use of school-based and community-based prevention programs, and identifying and screening individuals at risk for SUD and OUD, um, substance use disorder and opioid use disorder, and referring to support services. So the majority of our prevention activities will be led by YAC. That is not to say they will be doing everything, but um, prevention is the name of their game, and so they are our expert on this grant program. Dustin, if you can move to the next slide. Treatment activities, to get a little bit more into depth here. Um, so screening and referring treatment patients with infectious complications, especially when we're talking about um, intravenous drug users. This is a complication that needs to be focused on. Um, recruiting, training, and mentoring interdisciplinary teams for clinical and social service providers. Um, just that collaboration opportunity, partnership building, as I referenced earlier. Um, increasing the number of providers and other health and social service professionals. So a lot of the various partners that um, are working through this consortium, as I mentioned earlier, are not only Valley County based, they are Ada County based, um, which as we know, Ada County has significantly more resources in many ways, and they will be able to bring those resources up to Valley County through these partnerships. Um, reducing barriers to treatment, absolutely key to supporting reduced deaths, reduced overdose, and reduced use. Strengthening collaboration with law enforcement and first responders, training providers, and enabling individuals and their families to navigate all of these treatment activities, recovery activities, and so on. And Dustin, if you can move to the next slide. And then we have recovery activities. So this is the last set of core required activities from HRSA. Um, so enhancing discharge coordination for people leaving inpatient treatment facilities and or the criminal justice system, expanding peer workforce and programming in various settings, and supporting the development of recovery communities. And that last bullet point I'm especially excited to share with you guys about. So Dustin, if you would move to the next slide. The consortium voted to include an additional activity that is establishing a hub or recovery center. So The Rock, as it is now known, this is their brand new logo, and it is located on Park Street in downtown McCall, will serve as a private office space for peer and provider counseling and services, a space where individuals in treatment and recovery can gather. Um, appropriately with masks and distancing, of course, um, provide client-facing center for uh, prevention, treatment, and recovery resources, and really for use by the consortium as a whole. So YAC and the Peer Wellness Center are the main leads of this center. Um, they recently hired an admin to oversee the site and to make sure that the office is operating. Um, it's very accessible by bus lines and nearby to frequently visited businesses. Um, so we really think this is going to be an asset to Valley County moving forward. And so with that, I will take any questions that the board has. Thank you, Laura. Um, floor is open for questions. Madam Chair, this is Elk. Yes, Elk, go ahead. I just want to say how wonderful it's been to see this little tiny program when we first started to take off and bloom and grow. Uh, one of the things I'm very interested in after you know, lengthy discussions with our coroner is what age group are, are we most concerned about 
And I'm waiting for that data to come in. As you guys know, most of Valley County is what you might say in the senior level age group. There's a lot of retired folks up here that sometimes get a little bit confused on how to handle their medication. And I'm hoping one of the things that we can get out of this whole thing is an educational program for those kind of folks, not, not to mix certain medicines and, and it's not an intentional overdose, a lot of accidental overdose in, the, in that senior population. And I'm hoping we can get on top of that. And I'm really glad that Laura's taking it on. I'm very proud of Dee Dee. She's done a great deal of work up here and uh, it's been wonderful. It's been really great to see that whole thing go. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Madam Chairwoman, if I may have a follow-up comment to that. Yes, go ahead, Laura. Thank you so much. Yeah, we really appreciate the support of the commissioners. Commissioner Maupin has been a regular um, convener and um, collaborator of various efforts to support this consortium, so really appreciate her partnership. Um, we also are lucky enough to be able to leverage some of our other programs at CDH. So through our Drug Overdose Prevention Program and through our Partnerships for Success Program, both funded by the State of Idaho, um, we are already working on exactly what you described, Commissioner Hasbrook. We have um, started deploying some doTERRA packets, which um, basically help drugs degrade, and so they aren't ending up in toilets and poisoning our water system or ending up in the wrong hands and also um, deploying lock boxes. Um, we've already developed a new, um, stronger collaboration with some law enforcement up there. So we hear you, I appreciate your feedback and would invite it at any point. Madam Chair, this is Ted. Yes, Ted, go ahead. Laura, thank you. A very comprehensive approach. I think this is gonna make some big differences for Valley County. I've got four questions quickly for you. Uh, I tried to write them down as fast as I could, but I didn't. In terms of the top five opioids, uh, I heard oxycodone is one. What were the other four? Yes, absolutely. So in Idaho, this is not Valley County specific because we don't have that data, but in Idaho, the majority of it is oxycodone, followed in order by hydrocodone, morphine, methadone, and codeine. Okay, thank you. Uh, follow on. Um, does the data show at this point in Valley County that most of the opioids are coming from providers or from other uh, avenues, such as being sold on the street, et cetera, et cetera? At this point, um, given the number of prescriptions that we're seeing in Valley County, especially compared with the U.S. and Idaho, um, I believe that it is provider. Um, based medications. However, I would have to double check on that and I would ha be happy to get back to you, Dr. Epperly. Okay, yeah, Laura, if you would, uh, I'd appreciate that. We can, we can do some additional things around educational activities on the physician's side to help. Uh, in the V Corp consortium that you showed us with uh, all the partners, um, uh, I didn't see physicians as part of that. Is that under one of the categories like St. Luke's Community Health or since since they may well be kind of the source of the most, I was just concerned that we didn't have them as part of the consortium. Yes, great question and thank you for bringing that up. Um, we are in contact with various providers through St. Luke's as well as Cascade Medical Center and Echo Idaho, as you well know, um, works with a lot of providers. They are kind of our inlet to that community. They will be the ones providing the majority of education to the medical community. And um, so we are deferring to them for their expertise in that area. Through the program, they will be kind of bulking up their um, lesser of resources offered, their trainings offered and so forth. Um, I do not know off the top of my head, I would have to double check with my team um, if we have any individual providers, um, medical providers that is, who are a part of the consortium. We do have psychological service providers, behavioral health providers. Um, so we definitely will make sure that we have that area represented. Perfect, and then the last question I have for you is, I was impressed with your key objectives, one of them being stigma reduction. I think that's really important. Uh, what are you doing specifically around stigma reduction? Great question. So um, we haven't delved into that too much as a part of this grant program specifically yet. However, VCOR as a whole has always been very supportive of 
the language matters presentation. If I'm not mistaken, I believe that has been provided to the board in the um, recent past. Um, but it is all about making sure that we're using the correct terms, making sure that we're talking about persons with opioid use disorder as opposed to drug users, um, making sure that we are talking about this um, from the um, position of it being a, a, a disease and not a problem that somebody um, fell into or that is completely their responsibility. They need support. Um, they need a whole community. So um, we'll be doing presentations to the community through this program. Um, and again, always invite some input from you on that. Okay, outstanding work. We look forward to seeing some of the results. Thank you. Great, thank you. Madam Chair, this is Diana. Yes, Diana. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, I'm just curious because we've had uh, we have a our own Treasure Valley Opioid Task Force up here, um, but one of the challenges that we've had is making sure we are um, not crossing wires with the statewide opioid task force. So I'm wondering if you can share how you how you partner with them and um, and not you know kind of get into competing lanes. Yeah. Thank you. Great question. Um, I think probably first and foremost, it's making sure that we have those open lines of communication. Our Drug Overdose Prevention Program Coordinator um, has contacts in all those various spaces. She's been serving as the interim project director for this program for the last few months, and um, she is in regular contact with various folks at the state. Um, other members of the consortium are also plugged into various work, work groups related to IROC, which I believe is what you're referencing. Um, so it's just making sure that we have those partnerships as opposed to those competitions and we're building off of each other and not duplicating work. I'd also know it's just very exciting to be talking about something that's not COVID. Never thought I'd be so <laughs> excited to talk about opioids. So thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Laura, for your presentation. Congratulations to you and ELT to you for being the recipient of this wonderful thing. And we, we will look forward to progress reports. So yeah. thank you. Be yeah, Betty Ann. Yeah. Is, yeah. Betty Ann, this is Ted. Can I ask just one follow on question to Laura? Yes, you may, Ted. Yeah. Uh, Laura, uh, with the top five opioids, uh, those are pretty much prescription items. Um, so it probably is more prescriber oriented. So I think that'll be a great approach uh, with the education on that side. I didn't hear you mention uh, heroin or fentanyl, uh, which uh, uh, or, or cocaine or methamphetamine. Uh, are we having issues like that in Valley County as well? Or is it pretty much just prescription opioids? I'm not going to say we're not having those issues. I think those are always something to be concerned about. However, our priority is certainly those prescription drugs. Um, we have our Partnerships for Success program, which is focused more specifically on methamphetamines. And so our program coordinator over there is really paying attention to that side of things. Um, we have a partnership with uh, Idaho, Idaho Harm Reduction Project, um, brand new conversations there. And so as far as intravenous drug use is concerned, we're paying attention to that. We're learning about it, um, but we're really focused on those prescription drugs at this point. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, hearing no more questions uh, for Laura, we will proceed with our agenda. Um, and we will do have hear from Jamie Larson for a presentation on our virtual therapy room uh, created for the delivery of our infant and children's mental health. So Jamie, go ahead. Hi everyone. As mentioned, Hi. oh thank you, Madam Chair. By the way, um, as mentioned, I'm the behavioral health clinician with our infant and early childhood mental health program. Um, it's been quite a while since I've attended a board meeting, so just a quick recap. I um, see clients ages zero to five, and prior to the current safety precautions, I was seeing clients in their home. So I was bringing activities and kind of interventions to do in the home with the clients and their families together. Um, that has changed a lot over the last few months. I'm now seeing clients over telehealth and that has presented some unique challenges on how to get clients in that age range to kind of interact over video and still be interested in participating in the interventions. 
So I wanted to share with you all kind of a fun and innovative way of um, that we've developed to keep clients engaged and to still provide the interventions that they need. Well, kind of, you know, they don't really know that we're providing the interventions. They kind of just think it's fun. So I'm going to share my screen with you. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So this is the kind of welcome screen. So when I first meet with a client, this would be where we would join and kind of go over what would be the topics for the day. Um, I typically, so I can change this before any session. So I'll typically put a topic up there, but if the family has something during the check-in time that they really want to work on. Like if they're like, we really want to work on listening today, then we'll work on that. But if they don't have anything in mind, then we'll kind of work on whatever my topic was just to make sure that we're meeting the goals and the objectives of the treatment plan. Um, so I typically start out with a warm-up activity. So I'll show you an example. So this little um, parrot right here links to one of the warm-up activities that I like to do with the clients. So if you click on that, it will bring you to a little activity that we can do together. And for this particular activity, you just choose a card and then whatever's on the card, the client does that. Um, this is a timer over here. So you press play on the timer and then you do the activity and then you can um, go back to the beginning and you can do as many as you want or you can do just one if you want to. It kind of depends on the, the clients and the age. And then we'll move on to whatever the activity is for the day. So I have several different therapy rooms that I've developed and I'll show you each of them quickly because there's a lot of them. And um, so this is the all of the items on the shelves link to the room. So the first one that I'm going to click on is this little bunny up here in the top corner. And this one is kind of the playroom. So this is where I would go if I wanted the client to do some kind of client directed play or to give them a chance to explore and see what items they choose. So any of the items that are in the room, you can click on them and they'll bring up activities. So for example, um, if the client were to click on this um, little teacup right here, then it would open up a little Daniel Tiger tea party for the client to do. And if they were to click on the Legos, it would open up a Lego building activity. So all of these activities are client are kind of the things that clients can do on their own, but my video is still on and I'm still interacting with them during the entire session as well. And then um, if you want to go back to the beginning, then you just click on this little star in any of the rooms and it will bring you back to this first room. So this fish tank on the shelf is kind of the calm corner. So this room is full of art and music and just different mindfulness activities that are also sensory related. So a couple of examples in here, um, I mean, the fidget spinner will bring you to a fidget spinner. So that one's fun. And then the spirograph, same thing. The instruments, you can play any of the instruments. Um, if you click on the little mandala on the wall, it will bring you to a kaleidoscope painter where you can kind of paint your own kaleidoscope. So that's kind of fun. And then if you click on the, um, this little paintbrush, it'll bring you to an activity where you can um, create your own music. So the client, for example, could draw a picture over here, or they could write something, they could kind of do whatever they wanted, and then it will turn it into a song for them. Little fish 
fish over here will bring you to the ocean of emotions. So this one is for kind of beginning to learn about emotions. So everything in this room is related to emotions on a really beginner level. So a couple of examples in this room would be um, if you click on the starfish over here, that will bring you to a feelings game where you can look at different faces and see what feeling that person is feeling. Um, there's videos and all of the books on the shelves are read aloud. So you can also click on any of those and be able to um, listen to those books together with your client. Um, if you click on this one over here on the shelf, this will bring you to the yoga room. So in this yoga room over here, all of the animals are linked to different um, yoga exercises that you can do with the client. And then all of the things on the shelves are different meditations and breathing techniques that you can practice with them. So, and then on the tree are different mindfulness books that you can read with them. Again, those are read aloud, so you can click on any of those. So for example, if you click on the sloth poster on the wall, that'll bring you to a rainbow breath from Go Noodle and you can practice that with them. And then if you wanna do a yoga activity, you can click on um, one of the little animals down here and it will bring you to a yoga activity to do with them together. And then I have a forest of feelings. So this one is the forest of feelings. Some of these activities in here I created myself. So I'll show you a couple of examples. Um, these are books that you can read with them again. And then all of the objects will bring you to different online activities. Um, these little forest friends over here will bring you to different scavenger hunts that you can do with your clients. So you can kind of click on those and they can do the scavenger hunts in their homes. So those are kind of fun and clients really like those. And then if you click on these little forest friends over here, that'll bring you to a mindfulness activity that you can do together with the client. So you just start at the beginning and you make it through each color and each color has a different type of activity. So for example, if you clicked on the pink one, um, it would bring you here and you would do a mindfulness activity together. And then after you completed that mindfulness activity, you could go back, click on another color. This one will bring you to a breathing technique that you could practice together. So it's kind of a fun way to practice mindfulness with them, but also for them to play a game as well. And then if you click on the planet up here, this one will bring you to the galaxy of growth. So this room is all related to social emotional growth. So we have um, each planet will bring you to a different um, topic. So if you click on the brain room, this room is all about um, learning about the brain and self-control. So there's videos on fight, flight, or freeze, um, videos about the hand model and flipping your lid, um, sense, learning about the five senses, if you click on that one. So there's lots of different, that's a game to learn about the five senses. And then, um, so, and then all of these little clouds up here are different short little breathing exercises that you can practice with them. So for example, if you click on that one, it'll bring you to a box breathing exercise that you can practice together. In the listening room, it's kind of, um, they, they're kind of all similar. So lots of books, lots of activities, and then lots of things related to listening and following directions. So if you click on the little monkey up here on the planet, that'll bring you to a Cosmic Kids um, listening game that you can do together with them. Um, this one is a Simon Says game that I created, so you can practice listening that way. Um, just doing different Simon Says activities. And then there's a room for patients. So they're kind of the same thing, all different puzzles, um, I spy activities, mazes, just different books to learn about patients and 
different activities for the client to do. And then self-awareness. Um, this one has a game that, that I created, a would you rather game. So this one is for the client to kind of learn about themselves and for you to learn about the client as well. It has lots of different would you rather questions and you can just kind of answer those together and um, practice self-awareness that way. There's also a um, sand tray. So you can click on that and you can choose a prompt. So if you wanna learn about the client's family, then you can choose the first one and ask them to make a tray about their family. And then you can go to the virtual sand tray and you can have them choose different um, people of what their family might look like and kind of put those on the sand tray and move it around and you can add different objects and different things onto the sand tray. And then there's a room for kindness and there is a room for friendship as well. So this one is kind of working on social skills and Back to the beginning, there's a little book nook. So this one is all full of books that you can read together and you can change these out and put in different books at any time. And then there is, if you're wondering what the toilet paper is for, <laughs> there's a little potty training room. So this one is for working on hygiene and potty training for the really young kiddos. So there's some books and posters and you can click on the toilet and it will have a fun Sesame Street potty game connected to that. So. Um, you can play that with them. And back to the beginning. So the other really cool thing about these rooms is that you can also send any of the activities to the clients. So I've also found it as a really um, easy way if the, because zero to five year olds, they're not always in the mood to video chat or to interact in the session. And so it's a really easy way to send the activities afterwards if they're not able to participate at that time. So it's been really great in that way on being able to continue between sessions on working on different interventions and goals as well. And with that, are there any questions? Betty Ann? Uh, yes, Jane, go ahead. No, this is Megan. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> go ahead. That's Megan. all right. It's, you're flying blind. <laughs> hey, I have a quick question um, about technology and, and internet access. And are we providing the technologies or is it dependent upon um, the client to provide them? It is dependent on the client to provide the technology. Um, however, I haven't had any that haven't been able to do it for that reason because you can use it over the phone, um, you can use them over video chat, and I can also turn them into PDFs and send them to the clients on a PDF and the links still work as well. So there's lots of different options for getting the activities to the clients. Madam Chair, uh, this yes, is Diana. Go ahead. Um, yeah, thank you so much. So this is really cool, very exciting, and um, one of the really kind of more to Representative Blanksma's question. Um, I know in the past um, we had been more limited in our ability to get these services out to some of our more rural um, parts of the district, and so um, is this one of those sort of silver linings of COVID where you're able to get to some new folks. Could you share that? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, this is a great way to be able to reach clients in those rural communities. We are accepting referrals from all different areas within our district. So um, any Valley County, Elmore County, Boise County or Ada County, we can use these with all of them. So yeah, it has the, it ha that definitely has been a silver lining and it has increased access to be able to reach some of those rural areas. Hey, yeah, this is Ted. Uh, yes, Ted, go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, Laura, first, I'm, I'm really impressed with this. This is tremendously co complex and uh, uh, I can't imagine the amount of time that went into creating these. Uh, a couple questions. How long have we been doing it? What have our 
what does the data show us? Are we effective with the outcomes in regards to making differences? How are we measuring all of that? So we've been doing telehealth since March um, over video chat. We've been using these virtual therapy rooms less probably, I would say for the last few months, I did do telehealth without them for a while. And then I realized that my clients weren't that interested in talking with me over video or in doing my activities that I have here with them on the other end. So I wanted to create something that, you know, would get them more engaged. Um, my clients love being on their tablets and a lot of them were kind of getting bribed to do the sessions by you know, they would get tablet time afterwards. So I was like, how can I use that to kind of in the session, get them to stay engaged with me longer. So it took a little while before I started developing them and using them. Um, as far as the tracking goes, I track the progress with the treatment plan. So just like I always would, I will say that working towards the actual treatment goals has improved since using these rooms because I have so many more interventions available to use towards working on those treatment goals since developing these. So that has increased. So the amount of treatment goals that are being met has increased. The client engagement has increased. Some of the parents are saying, like they're asking all week to go to the, or to go to the rooms they call them so they, the parents are like, this is the longest they've ever um, paid attention to anything. So the, the children are really enjoying it. And the um, parents are present during every session, regardless of whether I'm using these rooms or not. So the parent engagement has stayed about the same, but the child engagement has definitely gone up. Now, this is Jane. Yes, Jane, go ahead. Amy, this is exciting, really exciting. You are one creative soul. I really appreciate all the work you've done. Um, I wanted to ask how long are the sessions and how often do you usually see them? And what is the average like length of therapy so far? So the sessions when I was going into the home were an hour. Um, since switching over to telehealth, it's been a, a little less. So the sessions are typically between 30 and 40 minutes. Um, I don't think that I can get a zero to five year old to stay on it with me longer than that. So the sessions have gotten shorter. Um, and then what was the other part of your question? I'm sorry. Um, how often you're seeing them okay. and, and how long for, so I'm seeing them weekly. So I see all of my, most of my clients weekly. I have a couple that I see every other week if they request it, but those are kind of my adult clients, all of my kid clients I'm seeing weekly. And um, it depends on the diagnosis on how long I see them for, but um, on average, the goal is between six months to a year. So hopefully we can meet all of the treatment goals within that time. Thank you. It's really exciting. Thank you. Betty Ann, Betty Ann, this is Ted. I have a yes. just a quick yes, follow-up. Go ahead. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Jamie, did is this all your work uh, in regards to to this because uh, if it is uh, we need to copyright this uh, because <laughs> this could be very useful uh, if scaled uh, across the nation i think play therapy for kids and parents can be a marvelous way to start to help solve problems and if you have that kind of engagement uptake with families and uh, parents and, and children uh, and the data would support improvement, this, this could be a big deal. So to answer your question, I did create all of these rooms myself. So I um, created them, created the image, well, I didn't create the images, I used the images, but I put them in the rooms and kind of designed all of it, added all of the links. So I did create the rooms myself. Um, there are other therapists and teachers that are doing similar things across the nation. So it started with kind of teachers making them for their virtual classrooms. And then there are some um, therapists that have been doing the same thing. So it's definitely catching on and people are beginning to use them um, more and more. So I started at the very beginning with it and there wasn't like nobody even knew what they were. And now people are kind of starting to um, use them more and more. 
Really outstanding work. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any more uh, questions for uh, or discussion regarding Jamie's project there? So, well, this is Jamie, Jamie, I just had one more question. I'm sorry, who just spoke? This is Jane. I just had one more question. Oh, yes, Jane, go ahead. It occurs to me as I'm looking at these, we see a lot of older folks and try to get them to use technology to connect as well. Do you ever use anything similar to this with adults? Because I could see them getting more interested in wanting to make the technology work. I haven't used them with adults yet. So I have a project that I'm working on um, that I want to use with my adult clients. So I've, I've been in the zero to three um, training for the last couple of years. And we talked a lot about in that training, the ghosts in the nursery. So I've been creating a room that is related to um, the ghost in the nursery and ACEs and kind of walking them through different, the ACEs questionnaires. And then if they answer yes to those ACEs questions, then that object will appear in the room to represent that. And so by the end of it, they could have a lot of different kind of ghosts in their um, nursery. So I've been working on that. I'm about halfway done with it. And that's one that I do want to work with the adults with, but I haven't been able to try it yet. That is awesome. I would love to see that as you're working on it. Okay. <laughs> Madam Chair, this is Russ. Uh, yes, Russ, go ahead. Yeah, as uh, Jamie mentioned uh, kind of early on in her presentation, it's been a while since she has talked with the board, but I just wanted to uh, mention, you know, she, besides all the wonderful work she's done around this, and sorry, Commissioner Lasciando, it's a little bit COVID related, right? Uh, but it's it's a useful tool and to Representative Blanksma's question, the ability to deliver this without having to get in a car and drive potentially hours to, to get to some of our the remote parts of our, our district. Um, it's just incredibly innovative. And then uh, just a reminder that Jamie really developed our infant and early childhood mental health program right from the start. And she, she put together uh, the Optum, uh, basically the Optum, what became the Optum contract, which is a Medicaid provider for behavioral health services in our state. And and met all the uh, requirements to have CDH be able to enter into that contract. So she's done an outstanding job uh, for the time that she's been with us. And this is just one more fine example of uh, her, her great work and innovation. Thank you, Russ. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Jamie, and congratulations on uh, your, your program there. So, um, any any further comments or questions for Jamie before we move on? Okay, well, thank you again, Jamie. And uh, moving on with our agenda, uh, we are down to district director's report. Um, Russ will be discussing uh, legislation which may impact our public health districts in Idaho. Russ, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. This will be brief. So what we have is uh, we had this, this special session that occurred and there was a lot of interest in including legislation that will directly impact local public health districts, local public health district authority to respond, for example, to a pandemic or to other types of outbreaks that may occur. None of that came came to be, uh, the special sessions, as you know, are, are narrowly defined. And we're hearing a lot, uh, me, uh, my colleagues around the state, different boards of health members from around the state about uh, legislation that's likely to come this coming legislative session. So I just wanted to, this is sort of a primer to, we need to be very prepared for that. Uh, Commissioner Hasbrook, as our trustee and executive council member, has been involved in at least one conversation with the other executive council members from each of the seven public health districts or the six other public health districts. And they're going to meet again on October 29th to further this conversation. But I, I just put it out there um, mainly for your awareness at this point, but I think we're going to have to be very engaged and tracking 
what happens very, very closely uh, so that we can essentially maintain the, the I think, exceptional structure that we have in the state and the authorities that we've been able to exercise to keep people safe during the pandemic and certainly during other outbreaks that occur outside of uh, the times we're in today. The only other item I have is just a quick preview of next week's board meeting, which will be on Tuesday at 515. We are going to present proposed orders, modified Ada County orders to allow visits to long-term care facilities with restrictions. And when I say with restrictions, our goal is to allow families, uh, friends, other loved ones to be able to, to visit uh, residents of long-term care facilities, but to be able to do it safely. Uh, as we know, our cases in Idaho are continuing to climb as they are here in Central Central District Health Four Counties. So it's, it's not something we're gonna take lightly. Um, we're putting a lot of thought into it. I'm hoping to have it published on our website as a draft on by Monday. Uh, and again, for the Tuesday meeting. And then the other agenda item for Tuesday was requested by a board member is to revisit the uh, school operational plan. So I reviewed that with all of you on Tuesday as far as the history, uh, kind of the local boards, uh, school district boards, uh, authorities, the state recommendations that came out from the from the State Board of Education and others at the state level and our decision to recommend that schools in Ada County, Blau and Red be uh, basically continue to operate at the phase that they're at with in-person learning. I don't think any, any schools full on K through 12, five days a week in-person learning. We're asking them not to continue to advance that, but to kind of hold where they're at, as well as to pause uh, close contact uh, athletic sports. So that's, again, a request by a board member. So I'm gonna put that as a second item on the agenda. So we'll have two items as well as probably the review of the minutes for today. And that's all I have, Madam Chair. Okay, okay. thank you, Rob. Madam, Madam Chair, this is Elf. Uh, yes, Elf, go ahead. And Russell, I got a question for you. Our executive council conference call is for the 29th and on the agenda it talks about discussion on hiring support support for LPH voice with the legislature. Can you tell me what LPH is? Is that just local public health? And does that make sense? Madam Chair? Yes, go ahead, Russell. Oh, that's exactly it. It's uh, local public okay. health. Okay, so then I need to ask the board how you guys feel about, because I'm sure the question is going to come up, are we willing to throw some money at possibly a lobbyist for the public health or, you know, it used to be that IEC did that for us, but they don't really lobby for us. They just kind of keep us informed. And this discussion came up here a while back about maybe we need our own separate lobbyists. And I want to know what the feeling from the board is on expending some money towards our own lobbyists for all the health districts. How does everybody feel about that? And then I also got to tell you, I'm down to 2% of my computer, so I might lose you any minute. <laughs> <laughs> Comments from board members? Uh, Madam Chair, this is Ted. Um, Ted, go ahead. You know, um, maybe, Russ, uh, you can educate us on this. Um, as a public health department, uh, are we allowed to do that uh, in terms of a lobbyist? I, I, I don't know exactly what the rules or law are about us as a quasi-governmental entity. Can we can we do that? Madam Chair, this is Russ. Yes, Russ, go ahead. My understanding is that we can. We have done this in the past for different uh, pieces of legislation. The one that I was really directly involved with a number of years ago was on the food license fees. So we have we have used Mike Kane in that capacity and he has registered as a lobbyist for our public health district, or in that instance, for, model, for all seven public health districts. Um, Madam Chair, if I could just follow on then. Yes, uh, if that's allowable, Russ, um, my sense is from what you just said in terms of your concern about watching carefully, 
uh, with uh, legislative activities that will come up this year. Um, I think we might want to do what else suggesting if indeed it's going to be harmful or deleterious to the public health mission and role. Um, so that those would be my feelings at this time. I, I guess uh, maybe, Megan, we can ask you a question. Uh, what do you think about this? Is there anything that we should be concerned about that we would potentially want to have our voice better heard? I don't know that by hiring a lobbyist that's going to advance your position for the cost. So um, I, it, I wouldn't be interested in putting money that direction. I, I understand that I, I think people overestimate um, the effect that that would have, but um, it's kind of on you. Uh, I will say I've seen drafts that's coming through um, some people have some pretty strong feelings about what's happening. Uh, I think the ch chance that there would be zero changes to the system are very, very slim. So I, I think that probably you'll, what you'll want to do is rely on Association of Counties and, and to have them follow it. But as far as hiring a lobbyist, I don't know that you're going to get enough out of it to make it worth the expense or the use of taxpayer dollars. Madam Chair, this is Elf. Uh, yes, Elf. Go ahead. Um, I kind of feel the same as Megan does right now. I think um, I've noticed the last couple of years, the Executive Council, there's some members on there that really want to kind of jump the gun on a lot of these things and try, try and get ahead. I'm not sure where the conversation is going to go when we do have this, but I think right now for our $12,000 we pay every year to IAC, um, we're getting that representation. He's letting, Seth is letting us know kind of what's coming down the pike, but I, I wanted to get your guys' feeling before I, I express that during the executive council, how you felt about it. So it's not my decision, it's the board's decision. And I and I, I agree with Megan. I think we just need to write, keep writing this, and see where it goes, and uh, and then maybe have to react later on, in who knows, maybe February or January sometime if we start seeing some bills come through that we know it just isn't going to work. Madam Chair, uh, yes, Megan, go ahead. Just uh, just the point of order. We don't have this as an action item, so. No. It would need to be added just to remind everybody we would have to add it to an agenda if you want to have any kind of motion on this. Yeah, but I think it's important to get your guys' feelings on this, how you feel about this. That's part of the trustee's job is not to vote my own personal beliefs, but it's the board's beliefs. So I'm tracking with, with everyone else here, Elt. Um, I would say, I mean, Representative Langsma, you have your fingers on the pulse of the legislature probably more than any of us so i i hope you'll keep us updated on, on where we're at we can have some robust conversations about that um you know we'll we'll all see what happens it's a it's always a rocking good time madam chair this is ted yes ted go ahead yeah i hear megan's point um you know if we are going to take a formal action i totally agree we would need to agenda this since Elt just asked a general question, Elt, I would just opine that I think we do stay with just the IAC at this point. And if there were something that would need more advocacy, then we could put it on as an agenda item and discuss uh, and potentially uh, go the lobbyist route. I think status quo right now is okay with the IAC. And then we could uh, see how uh, things develop in the legislative session. Matt. Yes, who just spoke? Um, this is Jane trying to speak. Oh, okay, Jane, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to know Russ's opinion on that. Russ? Um, Madam Chair, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a difficult situation because uh, if you, if you wait too long and we get behind 
and we don't have anyone in a position to represent us besides Idaho Association of Counties, you might never catch up. Uh, you know, we've had legislation brought forward just about every legislative session from, you know, environmental health issues and septic systems and immunizations. And it just depends on, you know, how much traction legislation gets and how quickly it moves through the both bodies of the legislature. So I guess my thought at this point in time is let's uh, have ELT report back to this group after the 29th. Uh, Seth Gregg, the executive director of the Idaho Association of Counties, has been participating on those calls, and I expect he'll be on this one. And and my suggestion is not to make, obviously, we're not making a decision today. He's looking for the, the, the sense of where the board wants to go. And then based on a discussion on the 29th and maybe subsequent discussions of the executive council and then make a decision. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everybody. That helps me out a lot because Lisa, I kind of know what you're doing. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any further any further comments? Uh, Madam Chair, this is a separate question for, for Russ. Yes, go ahead, Ted. Russ, maybe if you could just give us uh, just a quick overview of where we stand with influenza. Uh, I know we've got several active cases now in the community that are test positive. Um, uh, a couple questions. Number one, Russ, uh, how much activity do we have? Uh, number two, uh, um, uh, any suggestions from the public health perspective because the potentiation of COVID and influenza together are synergistic. It's a one plus one equals five sort of scenario with people getting both infections. So uh, any thoughts on uh, one level of activity, two, do we need to do anything different at this point from your perspective? Madam Chair, this is Russ. Yes, Russ, go ahead. Yeah, Dr. Epperly, exactly what you just said. We're starting to see activity. We're starting to hear of cases getting reported or sentinel surveillance. So it's not a reportable disease. We don't track it, you know, specific number of cases. Certainly not, not like we're doing with COVID. So, um, so that number one, absolutely, it's it, we're starting to see it already. And the as far as what we should do is what we're currently doing is working to heavily promote getting a flu vaccine. You know, there's some information coming out of the southern hemisphere, right? They're coming out of winter, where some countries were able to keep flu at bay. But from what I understand, uh, in those from the reliable data that we received, a lot of those countries were in a lockdown mode. They People weren't leaving their homes. They, they weren't even going to their workplaces when they could work remotely. So I think that's a, that's a far different scenario than what we're seeing in the United States and certainly here in Idaho. So I think we're gonna see a lot of flu this year. And, and to your point, uh, having, having flu at the same time as COVID will likely increase, far increase the number of deaths we've already seen. Uh, which, as, as you know, as a family physician, are more than double what we would typically see in a flu season just from flu. So I, I suspect uh, it's going to get far worse, and we will continue to push that message of how important it is to get the flu vaccine. Yeah, thanks, Russ. Appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Um, any further items to discuss before I call for a motion to adjourn? Hearing none, I will call for that motion for adjournment. Madam Chair, Chair, this is Ryan. Uh, yes, Ryan, go ahead. I'd, I'd make a motion that we adjourn. I'd second that. Uh, uh, who seconds? Megan. Oh, okay, thank you, Megan. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll go ahead and call for a vote by county for adjournment. Valley County? Commissioner Hasbrook, aye. Elmore County? Representative Blanksma, aye. Boise County? Commissioner Sturm, aye. Ada County? Jane Young, aye. Ted Epperly, aye. Commissioner Lachando, aye. OK, 
okay, motion for adjournment passes. Uh, thank you, folks. And as Russ mentioned, our next meeting will be next Tuesday, the 20th, at 5.15. And I want to thank everybody for their input and participation. And uh, thank you for the public who's listening in. So at this point, our meeting stands adjourned. And have a wonderful weekend, everyone. Bye now. Stay well, everyone.